Our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Lucas uh, Kello. Uh, Lucas uh, is a joint uh, postdoctoral. Dr. Lucas Kello is a, a postdoctoral research fellow in the International Security uh, Program and Science, Technology, and Public Policy uh, Program. He is uh, exploring the uh, implications of cyber weapons for international relations and security. I promise you we'll switch to other uh, disciplines. And uh, uh, Kelo holds a, a Bachelor of Degree for Harvard College and uh, uh, as well as a Master's and Doctorate uh, in International Relations from Oxford University. Uh, uh, pre um, presently, he uh, designs and teaches with the Harvard faculty uh, postgraduate uh, courses at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, in International Cybersecurity. So uh, please, Dr. Kello, please. Thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my first and only other time in Israel was in 2002, in a much uh, a younger version of myself. And that was not the most auspicious moment to visit your country. And there were questions over the summer whether 2014 was going to be an auspicious moment. <laughs> and I always insisted that I was going to be here um, because, well, whether it's auspicious or not, that depends on one's personal philosophy of adversity. So um, I'm an adherer of the view that it is always auspicious to be here in Israel and having uh, academic discussions. So thank you for having me. And um, my presentation is not up there. But Well, you'll notice a discrepancy in my current affiliations. Uh, I was at Harvard up until uh, this summer for three years. Uh, I maintain my affiliation there, but my primary affiliation is shifting back um, to Oxford, where I'll be, uh, starting October, I will be joining the faculty at the Department of Politics, and also um, establishing and running um, the new Cyber Studies Program, which is a major new research initiative that is uh, funded by the European Social Fund. Um, so we have a lot of ideas and development as to how to integrate uh, cyber studies into political science and international relations. And that's really going to be the substance of my talk today. So the problems, enormous problems, that that task uh, confronts. And I realize I have a very short amount of time. I have to speak quickly. Yesterday there were people extending their talks because the Prime Minister was late. Today I'm going to imagine that the Prime Minister is outside, eager to come in. So uh, a lot of this may seem a bit perfunctory, but hopefully it will give you a sense of the problems and the challenges that we as political scientists are dealing with. And let me emphasize that. I'm a political scientist and specifically a scholar of international relations and security studies, and that's the perspective from which I approach this uh, technological space. And what I'm going to be talking about today, which is the core problem, I think, of cybersecurity, is the problem of technological emergence or revolution in strategic affairs, which has to do with the, with the appearance of an entirely new class of weapon system, which unsettles some of our fundamental axioms of strategic affairs. This is not a new problem. We've seen it before. And with this picture here, I'm, I don't mean to draw any direct um, parallels between, say, nuclear technology and cyber technology, but it is merely to emphasize that we have dealt with this problem of strategic adaptation to new technologies before, and there are perhaps meta lessons, right, that can be learned from those experiences. Um, my promise to you today, in the short time that I have to deliver on it, is that you will understand how little we, as a scholarly community, understand about this problem, and also how little uh, international relations and political so uh, science scholars um, have attempted to deal with these problems. I'm going to start off by elaborating shortly on the, that root problem of strategic adaptation. I'm going to move on to discuss uh, basic methodological problems in cyber studies and political science. In other words, um, the pro problems within cyber studies. I'm going to then 
briefly review the core substantive problems and debates, which are the problems for cyber studies. In other words, if you are a political scientist and you want to engage in this field, this, these are the core substantive debates. And then, very briefly, I'm going to sketch um, future challenges uh, for our field. Any political scientists in the room? One, two, three, four, five, a few others in the closet, perhaps? Well. <laughs> A few brave souls of you have made it in here more than I suspected because we are a small bunch and that is a problem um, which I will get to. But let me first turn to the root problem which is the problem of strategic adaptation. And it is based on a very simple uh, rather gross generalization which is that if one looks at major strategic blunders historically one sees that some bad theory of a new technology was behind it. Right? Just, just take one example. In uh, the first two months of the First World War, um, German U-boats sank four British cruisers, three of them in a single action. Why? Because the British Navy, the glorious Royal Navy, which you see dominating the high seas in 1912, had no capability to detect submerged vessels. And even if they did have that capability, they had no capability to uh, intercept and destroy those vessels. What was the result? The result was millions of surface uh, tons of, of, of millions of tons of surface hardware rendered obsolescent almost overnight. And that's the glorious British Navy on the right, lower right, in 1917, sequestered largely at port because they were afraid to go out. So we have seen this uh, pro problem before. And what I submit to you today is that the cyber age, our current cyber age, presents uh, similar challenges of adaptation. Why do we face this problem? We have two uh, famous, or I should say one famous and other less famous Harvard scholars who uh, elaborated on this problem uh, decades before. And it basically has to do with this problem. That if you are a policymaker and a decision maker, the sheer pressure of events forces you to take policy action and open policy courses, right, immediately. And Whereas the process of strategic adaptation and interpretation is a slow, laborious, essentially scholarly process. Right? What that means is that the conditions are right for you to apply outmated concepts and axioms in your policy actions. And there's an interesting anecdote behind this um, slide here, which is that uh, Henry Kissinger was the assistant director of the Inter uh, Center for International Affairs at Harvard in the 1950s, and the director was um, uh, uh, Robert Bowie up, at, up on the left, and the two men despised each other. They shared uh, 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 two offices in a single lobby, and, and uh, the, the kind of the anecdote is that when Henry Kissinger would go out of his office, he would always call his secretary to make sure that the guy up on the left wasn't hanging about there. So it's an interesting uh, personal rivalry, but they, ex they agreed on at least one essential point, which was this root problem that I'm talking about. Right? So it is, it is a basic fact that the emergence of cyber weapon systems poses formidable challenges to strategic theory. And, and don't just take it from me, take it from one of the um, esteemed speakers at this uh, event, right, General Keith Alexander, who has observed that there's really no consensus on how to characterize the strategic instability of our cyber uh, age or even on, on what to do about it. Take it also from your, uh, the words of your very own prime minister yesterday who made exactly this point, right? He said that strategic and policy challenges in our cyber age are enormous. And I got the sense from what he was saying that, you know, this is, that is a man and the people around him are constantly pressured to take action. But there are still these um, uh, elemental quandaries of strategy that remain to be resolved, which is why they create these magnificent research funds, right, that they pass over to uh, academia. And that is a very important uh, interaction. So I've discussed the root problem. Now, what are the problems? for um, researchers who want to try to solve that root problem within political science and security studies. What we see is that those problems are indeed enormous and um, it has created certain types of skepticism, certain forms of skepticism within the field, within uh, eminent and established scholars in the field, 
which has created a huge scholarship gap. If, if one does a review of the literature, um, I know you were talking earlier about all these, uh, this explosion of, of research uh, articles and papers in this topic. If one narrows down to political science and international security, one sees that, that we have been, as a discipline, largely left out of that trend. And there are, in fact, the top journals in the field are, are, uh, have not published much in this area. Right? And that has to do, and you saw the pie chart as well, that uh, there, I, I noticed that there was, I was very happy to notice that there was no representation of political science. Well, I can now say that starting October, at least Oxford will have a department-wide uh, research initiative, and I don't know, maybe that takes political science up to 0.1%, but at least it's, a, it's, a, it's an existence. Um, but, so there are two forms of skepticism, basically, which I think provide barriers to scholarship. One is a, uh, uh, the good skepticism, which has to do with uh, the question, you know, uh, doubts about whether this new technology really is transformative or really is important for national and international security. I will, I will get to that briefly later. But there's a deeper, more fundamental form of skepticism, which has to do with the question of, can we, as a discipline, can we even examine this new space? Do we have the tools and the methods uh, to do so? And we see there are at least three significant problems. One of them has to do with the paucity of cases, observable cases that are available for political and social scientists to examine when elaborating on and testing our hypotheses. Right? Cases of cyber attacks that rise to the level of national security are, are, are not very many. But then secondly, there's limited knowledge on those cases already. There's very limited knowledge on those cases, right, because of the shroud of government secrecy, right? And the third problem has to do with the, uh, uh, the technology's scientific complexity. There are some people who have gone on record to argue that political scientists should not be looking at these technologies because we're not computer scientists. Well, that's kind of like saying back in the early nuclear era that if you are not a nuclear physicist, you shouldn't be looking at these technologies. So I think that's a fundamentally flawed um, argument. Let me turn to uh, some very briefly to the core substantive problem, which has to do with um, an essential debate, which is, are these um, uh, technologies revolutionary and transformative for security affairs, right? And if you look at the policy documents, clearly the answer is in the affirmative. But there are many people in political, scientists, uh, in political science who believe that, um, that there is no real transformative uh, or important uh, effect. And this has to do with um, established Clausewitzian notions of what security and conflict mean uh, for political as scientists, right? There's this general sense that these weapons are not intrinsically violent. And if someone who is used to analyzing cruise missiles and nuclear weapons, et cetera, right, and terrorism, one sees, well, where's the violence? Well, there isn't much violence, and therefore we shouldn't really be uh, looking at these technologies. This, will, this is really the core, the core debate today, insofar as a debate does exist within uh, political and social science. The counter-argument, of course, can go in various uh, directions, which uh, I, I will not take now because I don't have uh, the time. Right, but, um, but there are various directions that one can take. Right, one look at the potency of the weapons and the complications of defense. The potency despite the virtuality. Right, that's, that's the, uh, the important point. And then disturbances to strategic stability. And that last point is the one that I'm going to end on because it is essential to the future research directions and priorities for political scientists. Because if you are a political scientist and a scholar of international relations, you are used to working uh, at the level of the great powers or a small uh, number of large uh, states interacting and competing uh, with and against each other, right? And there is a fair bit of stability in, um, in the uh, aims, the interests, the identities even of these major actors. But if one looks at one of the real novelties and transformative aspects of the cyber age and, and, and the cyber domain, it has to do with the explosion of relevant actors, many of which are non-traditional actors who do not share in these basic uh, values and properties of states and certainly not of uh, the great powers. 
right? So that will pose really, the, I think, the core challenge, right, for political science and international relations looking forward. How do we adapt? And this is the question I leave to, to the political scientists in the room. How do we adapt our conceptual and theoretical frameworks to right, the novelties of this new uh, cyber phenomenon? And, th and that's really the challenge uh, looking forward. So I look forward to the rest of the discussion.